Centripetal force and centripetal acceleration are going to be the topics of this lesson in my brand new general physics playlist, which will eventually cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now, the context in which this is brought up is circular motion, and most commonly what we call uniform circular motion, as we'll see. And it's going to be a new context for which to talk about Newton's laws of motion as well, with a little wrinkle on how we solve them and set up free body diagrams and think of this sort in the past. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Okay, so we gotta go back and revisit circular motion a little bit here, so from, that, uh, from the last lesson. And, uh, in this case, we're going to have circular motion here going around in a clockwise direction. So I'm just a reminder that the instantaneous velocity anywhere on this circle is going to be tangent to the circle. So if I go to the top of the circle here, and let's do this in red, match what's on the study guide. If I go to the top of the circle, the tangent is right here. At that instant right there, whatever object might be attached, let's say this is something attached to the end of a string that's being swung in a circle. At that exact instant, that object is traveling in that direction. If you magically snapped the string or cut the string right at that instant, it would just go flying off in that direction. And so this is the direction of the linear velocity, which in this case we most commonly call the tangential velocity. So it's the instantaneous velocity for something on circular, uh, undergoing circular motion here. So at this point right here, it would point straight down, and at this point right here, straight to the left. Okay. Now we gotta talk about uh, uh, what we call centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. So what's keeping it on this circular path? Well, in this case, it's the string, we know that. So, but we have to give a, a description of the force that the string is providing. And in this case, that force, it turns out, always points toward the center of the circle. So in that acceleration that accompanies it as well. And we're gonna call this the centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. I'll label the acceleration specifically here. And so here it points toward the center of the circle. Here it points toward the center of the circle. And here it points towards the center of the circle. And so if you notice like at the top position right here, so if we had something attached again on a string going around and around, at that instant, it's traveling to the right. But there is something causing it to accelerate downward and keeping it on that circular path. And so that's uh, that, that centripetal acceleration that's keeping it on that circular path. Okay, and there's a force accompanying that centripetal acceleration we call the centripetal force. And just like F equals MA, in this case, we're gonna to refer to it as F equals MAC, as we'll see. All right, and it turns out that this centripetal acceleration, the most common example we'll be dealing with is what we call uniform circular motion, where we're traveling at a constant speed. Now, just because we're traveling at a constant speed does not mean we're traveling at a constant velocity. Now, you might recall that acceleration equals change in velocity over change in time. Now, if we're traveling at a constant speed, you might be like, well, how is this not going to equal zero, Chad? So, great question, but don't forget that velocity is a vector. It has both magnitude and direction. And even though the magnitude of the speed might not be changing if we're doing uniform circular motion, the direction is. And if the direction is changing, then there is an acceleration. And this can't equal zero in such a case. And so we label this AC, and it is not equal to zero. But it turns out its magnitude is equal to V squared over R. So that tangential velocity divided by the radius, that is the magnitude. And so if that's the, mag uh, the expression in the magnitude for the uh, centripetal acceleration, then the centripetal force, substitute that in, it's gonna equal m times v squared over r. So and here's a couple of new equations that are gonna be relevant to this chapter. So the equations for centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. All right, in the same light here, we start doing Newton's laws of motions problems. So if you recall back in the day, we had a couple different situations. We had some of the forces equaling zero, and we had some of the forces equaling ma. If an object was in equilibrium, either because it wasn't moving or it was moving at constant velocity, Newton's first law applied when some of the force equals zero. So if it had an acceleration, its velocity was not constant, so then the sum of the forces equaled ma. Well, in this chapter, when we start dealing with Newton's laws of motion, as long as you're talking about the direction that points toward or away from the center of the circle, the sum of the forces in that direction is now going to add up to mac, i.e. 
mv squared over r instead. So and I'll, I'll qualify this just a little bit. Technically, the proper way to look at this is to say it actually adds up to negative mv squared over r, and then you've got to define your directions in a, a particular way and stuff like that, uh, which I find students find is a little confusing and stuff like that. I'm just going to say it equals mv squared over r, and that this points toward the center of the circle. And so the forces that point towards the center of the circle will end up being positive just like this. The ones that point away from the center of the circle will be negative. So whereas truth be told, the conventions actually do the opposite. But I see students, you know, screw it up all the time. So we're just going to uh, set it up just like this. If the focus is centripetal force, then by all means, let's make that centripetal force a positive quantity. So just know I'm defying convention here just a little bit. All right, so we've got a couple more terms to talk about, but they're only gonna be relevant if we're not talking about uniform circular motion. We're talking about circular motion where the speed is not constant. So and as you go around the circle, either the object that's going around the circle is either speeding up or slowing down as it goes around the circle. It's linear speed, it's tangential speed is not constant. So in such a case, it would now have an angular acceleration. So if you recall, angular acceleration is alpha. So, and if you recall, the relationship between acceleration and angular acceleration, so it's just multiplied by the radius. So notice angular acceleration is radians per second squared, multiplied by meters would get you meters per second squared. So, well, in this context, we're gonna call this now tangential acceleration. And the tangential acceleration points in the same direction as the tangential velocity. It's gonna be tangent to the circle. And so, again, if, if the overall speed around the circle is not changing, then there is no tangential acceleration. But let's say we're speeding up faster and faster and faster and faster. All of a sudden, now we have a tangential acceleration. And again, it's always going to point in a direction that's tangent to the circle. And so now we've actually got two different types of acceleration going on. We have this tangential type, but then we also have the centripetal as well. And they're 90 degrees apart, always for circular motion. And in such case, then, if what if we want the total acceleration. Well, the total acceleration has to take into account both components. And these components, conveniently enough, are perpendicular to each other. And so we have to add them as vectors in this case. And being that they're perpendicular, you can just use Pythagorean theorem to add them together. And so that total acceleration is going to equal the square root of the tangential acceleration squared plus the centripetal acceleration squared. And again, these last two terms, the tangential acceleration and then this total acceleration, they're only going to be relevant if, instead of uniform circular motion, we have circular motion where there's actually uh, an angular acceleration. If there's no angular acceleration, you won't have to worry about either of these. The only type of acceleration that will be relevant will be centripetal acceleration in such cases. So let's work some problems. The first one here says, an astronaut in space where gravity equals zero, swings a 0.25 kilogram yo-yo attached to a 2.0 meter long string in a circular pattern with a constant tangential speed of 4.0 meters per second. So constant tangential speed, this means uniform circular motion. So the speed is constant around that circle. Uh, what is the centripetal force and acceleration of the yo-yo is the first part of the question. The second part is gonna be what is the tension in the string? So let's just draw a yo-yo here. So we'll attach it to a string. We're told this string is 2.0 meters long. We're told the yo-yo weighs 0.25 kilograms, or has a mass, I should say, of 0.25 kilograms. And it's gonna have a constant tangential speed of 4.0 meters per second. Okay, so we want the centripetal force and acceleration of the yo-yo, and it's kind of plug and chug here. So centripetal acceleration, centripetal force. So in this case, centripetal acceleration is just V squared over R. We needed that tangential speed. It was simply provided. So 4.0 meters per second, don't forget to square it, divided by the radius, which was also provided. So four squared is 16 divided by two is gonna get us eight. So, and again, notice the units, one of the meters is canceled. It'd be meters squared over second squared divided by meters. So it's gonna come out in meters per second squared, and we should get this two sig fig, so we'll make it 8.0. Okay, same thing now with the centripetal force. So you could look at it as m times ac, or m v squared over r. And in this case, because we've already actually calculated the centripetal acceleration, we can plug that in right here. So the mass was given as 0 0.25 kilograms. 
So that centripetal acceleration we figured out was 8.0 meters per second squared. So 0.25 is one fourth and one fourth of eight is two newtons and to get it two sig figs, 2.0 newtons and there's your centripetal force. Okay, now the last part of this question is what is the tension in the rope? So, and now we've got a Newton's law of motion question. So, to set up a Newton's law of motion question, you're gonna start still with a free body diagram just like we did a couple chapters ago. And so if we look at this lovely yo-yo on a string, you might say, okay, what forces are acting on it? And in this case, the tension on the string is pulling straight down. So there's your tension on the string. And you might be like, hey, Chad, it's got a weight. Except the problem said what? Problem said astronaut is in space where gravity is zero. So we are in an, a weightless environment. So there's no weight associated with this thing. And the only force acting on it is that tension in the string pulling down towards the center of the circle. That's it. So again, for a Newton's law of motion question for circular motion, the sum of the forces now equal the centripetal force, if you will. So some of the forces, instead of normal MA, it's the centripetal A, which I just simply jump straight to MV squared over R. All right, so a couple things to note here. So the centripetal force is not an actual force. It's not a specific force. Something is always responsible for that force. In this case, it's the tension of the rope. For a satellite going around the Earth, it's gravity. There's something always responsible for the centripetal force. So it's a type of force, but it's not a specific force. And there's a lot of different for specific forces that can be responsible for this type of force, the centripetal force. Just keep that in mind. And so in this case, that centripetal force, again, always points toward the center of the circle. And in this case, the tension points toward the center of the circle. And so the only force we have tension has to equal mv squared over r. And again, normal convention would be to define the direction towards the center of the circle as negative, which means you put some, you'd put a negative sign here and a negative sign there, and they'd both cancel. I just skipped that. That's so uh, commonplace that personally, I like to define toward the center of the circle as positive. So in such cases, just my convention, I find students uh, get the problems wrong less often by doing so. So just again, realize I'm defying convention just a little bit. All right, so there we've got an expression for our tension, and it's just equal to that centripetal force we saw for a little bit ago that was equal to 2.0 newtons. So next question is going to involve a roller coaster going around a loop-de-loop, -loop, so to speak. Question reads, a 500.0 kilogram roller coaster car completes a loop-de-loop, -loop, radius is 10.0 meters, with a constant speed of 20.0 meters per second. So constant speed tells us this is uniform circular motion. Three part question. What is the normal force of the track on the car at the bottom of the loop? What is the normal force of the track on the car at the uh, top of the loop? And then what is the normal force of the track on the car at the side of the loop, either when it's the car is directed straight up or straight down? All right, so three part question. Okay, so a couple things to think about. So when you stand on a scale and it reads your weight, so don't forget that this, you know, you're pushing down on the scale with your weight, but the scale is pushing back on you with the normal force. And so anything that increases the normal force would increase the reading on the scale, so to speak, as well. And so you feel heavier, so in the motion of a roller coaster car, when there's a higher normal force between you and the seat of that roller coaster car. You feel lighter when there's a lower normal force between you uh, and the seat of that roller coaster car. And so if you've ever been on a roller coaster, you know that when you start to go down a hill, you feel lighter and you should expect a lower normal force at that point. But when you reach the bottom of the hill and start to go curve back up, you know that once you reach the bottom of the hill and curve back up, you feel heavier at that bottom as you go through that motion. So, and that's evidence again that you have a larger normal force. And same thing on this loop-to-loop, -loop, you're gonna feel the heaviest in your seat at the bottom. So, and therefore that should have, we should expect there to be the highest normal force there. But you're gonna feel the lightest in your seat when you're upside down. And in fact, if you go slow enough, you might find yourself feeling like you're falling out of your seat a little bit and stuff like that. So hopefully the roller coaster car is designed in such a way that that's not, uh, you're not gonna feel completely weightless and falling out of your seat, right? So 
Uh, but that's going to be the case, and, and again, evidence that you have a smaller normal force at the top. And then you have something in between on the sides, as we'll see. All right, so we'll start with the bottom of the car here. What is the normal force of the track on the car? And so we're going to set up a free body diagram, just like we did with Newton's Laws of Motion back in Chapter 4. So in this case, for the roller coaster car here, we've got a weight pointing down. We've got a normal force pointing up. And one thing to note here, you never label mv squared over r on the diagram. So again, that, that centripetal force is a type of force. It is not a specific force. So we only put specific forces on a free body diagram. So the question is, well, it's a type of force. So what does that, you know, what does that mean again? Well, it means that one of the specific forces on your free body diagram, or more than one, is going to be responsible for that centripetal force. Well, that centripetal force, again, points toward the center of the circle. And here we can see, oh, that normal force is going to be responsible for the centripetal force in this case. It's what's ultimately supplying it. All right. So let's now, we've got our only forces relevant here, the normal force and gravity. And again, they're going to sum up to mv squared over r in this case. And if, again, my convention is to, to make the toward the center of the circle positive and leave mv squared over r positive, that means our normal force in this case is positive and our weight is going to be negative. And our equation is going to be normal force minus mg equals mv squared over r. And then we can solve for that normal force, and it's going to be normal force equals mv squared over r plus mg. And now we can plug some numbers in. So normal force is going to equal 500 kilograms times 20 meters per second squared all over 10 meters for the radius and plus 500 kilograms times gravity 9.8 meters per second squared. Cool, we'll let our calculator do some work for us. So much of this we could probably do in our heads, but why bother? All right, so 500 times 20 squared divided by 10 is 20,000. So that's 20,000 Newtons right there. And then plus another, notice 500 times 10 would be another 5,000 or so. But in this case, 500 times 9.8 is another 4,900. So 20,000 plus 4,900 it's going to get us a normal force of 24,900 newtons. Okay, so that's our baseline. We said this is where we should expect the normal force to be the largest, where we feel the heaviest at the bottom of that loop-de-loop. -loop. Well, let's go talk about the top of the loop-de-loop -loop now and set up the free body diagram here. Your weight still points down. That has not changed. But now the normal force also points down. So that's crucial here. So again, the normal force is always the perpendicular contact force. And again, between the track and the car, it's definitely pointing down. And so these both point down, but the key is they both point towards the center of the circle. And again, I always make the center toward the center of the circle positive mv squared over r. And so in this case, these are both going to be positive since they point towards the center of the circle. And that might seem a little weird with gravity now. But again, I'm always orienting things with uniform circular motion toward the center of the circle. All right, so we set up the equations now, and it's going to be normal force plus mg equals mv squared over r. And solving for that normal force, mv squared over r now minus mg. And if you recall, when we plugged all the numbers in, those numbers haven't changed. We had 500 kilograms, 20 meters per second squared over 10, and that came out to 20,000. Newtons. And then 500 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, that came out to 4,900 Newtons. And so 20,000 minus 5,000 would be 15,000. So this is going to be 15,100 Newtons at the top. So at the bottom of the roller coaster, 24,900 for the normal force. At the top, 15,100. So, and you definitely feel heavier at the bottom by a fair amount than, you, than compared to what you feel at the top. And then finally, we've got the sides. And if we look at the sides here, so here we've got the normal force pointing towards the center. And then we've got the weight pointing straight down. They're in totally different dimensions now. And so we could set up a couple of different equations in this case. We could set up net force in the y direction, or in this case, net force in the x direction, which involves toward the center of the circle. So 
And the one that's going to be relevant in terms of centripetal force is the one towards the center of the circle. And the only force is the normal force. And so we're just going to have normal force. Gravity, the weight, is not in this part of the equation at all. And it just that's the only force toward or away from the center of the circle. And that's what adds up to a total of mv squared over r. Again, we could set up another one and talk about what's the net force in the y direction. And we find out it's just the weight. That's it. That's the net force. It's in the y direction. All right. So one thing to note, uh, keeping that in mind, it would be impossible for this thing uh, without some added force to maintain a speed of 20.0 meters per second all the way around the circle. Because as it went up, it would want to slow down because there is a net force. And so in this case, we're kind of cheating with the question. There would have to be some sort of force propelling the car to go faster that would exactly equal mg, but only on the sides. And that force would actually have to modulate all the way around the circle so that as the weight you know, component is not perfectly straight down uh, in the direction of motion and stuff like that, or opposing the direction of motion or with the direction of motion, that somehow we can keep this thing going at a constant 20.0 meters per second. So otherwise, you know, if, if the propulsion of what's propelling this car on the track was a constant force, uh, then we would not have a, a constant velocity in such case, it turns out. Uh, so just keeping in mind, we cheated a little bit in writing this question to get that, that speed constant by somehow having some magic modulating force to kind of counteract the weight exactly all the way around the circle. All right, so normal force uh, adds up to mv squared over r, which in this case, Again, that's that 500 kilograms times 20 meters per second squared all over 10 meters, which we said came out to 20,000 newtons. And if I want three sig figs, then I should make this 2.00 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4 newtons. And just like we said, that's intermediate. So again, at the bottom, 24,900 is the highest. At the top, 15,100 newtons is the lowest and right in the middle on the sides. So it's gonna be 20,000 Newtons all on its own. All right, one way to think about this, one other way to think about this is so at the top of the track, it makes sense that, you know, if we went slow enough, you might think these wheels might lose contact with the, uh, with the track and stuff like that. And so it makes sense that the, the normal force would be at a minimum up top there and stuff as well. So, but here you can see that the normal force, so, is working opposite to gravity. Gravity is working against it, which is why the normal force has to work even harder in this case, pushing back, if you will, and keeping it on circular motion. So last question here reads, a fan blade with a radius of 0 0.25 meters rotates from rest with an angular acceleration of 12 radians per second squared. What is the magnitude of the total acceleration experienced by a bug trying to remain stuck to the outer edge of the fan blade at t equals 0 0.33 seconds. So a couple things to realize here. So one, this is not uniform circular motion. Again, uniform circular motion happens when we have a constant speed at which we're rotating. Well, this thing's accelerating. We have an angular acceleration in this case where that angular acceleration is 12 radians, and we could write it as radians per second per second or radians per second squared. And so this doesn't apply. This thing is not only rotating here, but it's rotating faster and faster and faster as it goes around the circle. And so not uniform circular motion here in this case. Uh, and that's when it becomes relevant to even talk about a tangential acceleration. If your tangential speed is constant, then there is no tangential acceleration. And if there's no tangential acceleration, well, then that term is zero. And your total acceleration just simply equals the centripetal acceleration. And so it's only when you have an angular acceleration that your total acceleration is usually talked about because otherwise it would just equal the centripetal if we're, again, undergoing uniform circular motion. All right, so in this case though, we're gonna have to solve for that tangential acceleration. We're gonna have to solve for the centripetal acceleration and then use the Pythagorean theorem to put them together to get the magnitude of the total acceleration in this case. So, but it's gonna be mostly plug and chug. I've chosen really nice numbers here. So. Your tangential acceleration, well, you might recall that your tangential acceleration is just equal to r times alpha. And we were given both r and alpha, and we can just plug them in. And so in this case, radius was 0.25 meters. Alpha is given as 12, if I can spell radians here or abbreviate it properly, radians per second squared. So one-fourth of 12, and we're going to get a tangential acceleration of 3.0 meters per second squared. Okay, now for the centripetal, and this is going to be more plug and chug, 
for the most part, with a little bit of a twist. So it's equal to v squared over r. And the problem is, is we don't know the v right off the top of our heads. Now we know we want the v specifically at t equals 0.33 seconds. Well, this thing is accelerating. And so that v is getting faster and faster and faster. That's why they had to give us the specific instant in time when that applies. Now, one thing we could do, so is we could use our acceleration here to figure out omega. So the angular velocity at t equals 0.33 seconds, and then use omega through this relation to find the tangential velocity, and then plug it in here. Or we could just skip that step and substitute this right into the equation here instead. And so if we substitute r omega in for that tangential velocity, we get r omega all squared all over r, which is equal to r squared omega squared over r, and one of those r's is gonna cancel. And we're just left with centripetal acceleration equaling r omega squared. And so instead of having it expressed in terms of the tangential speed, we have it now expressed in terms of the angular speed instead. Cool, but from here it's gonna be plug and chug, but we need that omega. Now there's a couple different ways to look at this. We got some kinematics to do here. So the acceleration here, angular acceleration is 12 radians per second per second. That means it's speeding up 12 radians per second every second for the angular velocity. So after one second, starting from rest, the angular velocity is gonna be 12 radians per second. After two seconds, it would be 24 radians per second. After three seconds, the angular velocity would now be 36 radians per second. Well, the question is, is what is that angular velocity at t equals 0.33 seconds, one third of a second? Well, we're definitely not even gonna make it up to 12, right? In fact, we'd only get a third of the way up to 12 radians per second for an angular velocity which would be four radians per second. And you can use one of the kinematics equations here in this case. So if you recall, one of the kinematics equations said omega final equals omega initial plus a t. That's technically what we're doing. So, but again, if you understand what angular acceleration is, uh, you're getting there anyways. But in this case, your initial angular velocity is zero. And then it's just the 12 radians per second squared times 0.33 seconds, a third of a second gets you the four radians per second. So that's where that comes from. And we can just plug that in. So centripetal acceleration equals the 0 0.25 meters for the radius times the four, in this case, uh, radians per second all squared. And in this case, you can see, again, radians kind of a made up unit, but you're gonna get meters per second squared for your units here. So in this case, four squared is 16 times 0.25, which is one fourth is four. And now we've got both our tangential acceleration and our centripetal acceleration. And I made the numbers nice to work out so we wouldn't have to use a calculator so much here. And we're now ready to kind of calculate that magnitude of the total acceleration. Cool, we'll take the tangential, in this case, three meters per second squared squared plus the centripetal four meters per second squared all squared. 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 16 plus 9 is 25, and take the square root, and we're going to get 5.0 meters per second squared for that total acceleration. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.